one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You remember that? If you remember it, you're at least as old as me. I was about 10 years old when Neil Armstrong made that statement. I remember watching when Neil Armstrong was the first man to step on the moon. We were over at my granny's house, that's what we called her, and, and we all gathered around, and I was really into the Apollo missions, and and uh, remember watching it on black and white TV, and about the only transmission you were going to have from the moon back then, well, it was black and white, it was real fuzzy, wasn't great transmission, couldn't hear everything real well, but a remarkable thing to think that you'd have TV being broadcast from the moon into your living room, isn't that amazing? But Neil Armstrong made that statement. He was the first man to walk on the moon. Uh, The second man to walk on the moon was Colonel Buzz Aldrin. Uh, Buzz Aldrin's the astronaut that Buzz Lightyear was made after. You remember Buzz Lightyear? But Buzz Aldrin shared a little-known story. It was printed in Guidepost Magazine's article back in 1970 about a year after he had stepped on the moon with Neil Armstrong. It was titled, the Guidepost Magazine article, An Astronaut Tells of a Little Known but Significant Event on the Moon. And there was a book a few years later that Random House published called Return to Earth. And before the two astronauts stepped out onto the moon's surface, there was a planned time of rest. Buzz Aldrin asked for radio silence because NASA was fighting a lawsuit from atheist Madeline Murray O'Hare who objected to Apollo, the Apollo 8 crew having read a chapter of the book of Genesis. That was way back then. So Apollo 8 happened, read from the book of Genesis. You have this lawsuit going on. Buzz Aldrin says, let's just have a moment of silence. It's what took place in that moment of silence. So few people know unless you're familiar with the story. Buzz Aldrin, during that moment of silence, he then privately partook of communion. Wow. And what is even more interesting is he partook of communion privately before being the second man to step on the moon. And he had timed it so his church back in Texas would partake of communion at the same time they had their moment of silence on the Apollo 11. Uh, We're family. It was family on the moon partaking with family back here on earth. That is just the coolest thing. But I thought of that as I was preparing for this message today, and as we're entering into a time of communion. And uh, often when it comes to communion, I'll give a message, and then at the end of the message, we'll have a couple of minutes on communion and then engage in the communion service. And it's so easy to just uh, go right on through the motions and not really meditate on the Lord and forget what communion is really about. And sometimes I believe it's just really healthy spiritually and emotionally to get refocused. Now, let me explain it a little bit further. Uh, I, as many of you know, if you've been here for very long, I was raised Catholic as an altar boy. And, and one of the things, uh, don't misunderstand me and write me and tell me I'm a heretic, all right? I'm going to tell you one of the things I miss about the Catholic Church was the reverence that took place during communion. Now, I understand the doctrinal differences. You don't have to explain it to me. I probably know them better than you do, all right? But I, but it's, there's a certain reverence. There's a certain holiness of God that you get. If you get nothing else, you get that. And in the Protestant church, a Methodist, a Baptist, Presbyterian, and on down the list, Calvary Chapel of 412, it's easy to miss the reverence. It's easy to forget that God is holy and we are not holy. It's easy to forget that I'm a sinner who Christ died for. It's easy to not understand that no matter how bad of a sinner you are, there is no sin that you can commit that you can't be forgiven of if you just turn to Him. That, to me, is the most remarkable thing. Because the worst of sinners can be forgiven. The prostitute can be forgiven. The homosexual can be forgiven. One of the most remarkable things is that the gossiper can be forgiven. Because it is a sin, right? And uh, 
I, when it comes to communion, wow, the reverence of the Lord. So that's where we're going today to get refocused on this aspect before we partake of communion. Next week, we're going to pick up with One Life series. In fact, next week will be the last of the One Life messages before we start our next book of the Bible. So let's see as we partake of communion. You ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. Now in giving these instructions, Paul writes, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but you come together for the worse. In other words, you guys are messed up when you come together. Now remember, he's talking to believers in Christ. For first of all, verse 18, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. Now, I believe the reports that are coming to me about you guys. You got issues. Division. Verse 19, for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And, and one is hungry and another one is drunk. What? With an exclamation mark, verse 22. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? Shame those who are poor? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? Not a chance. I do not praise you. Well, let's stop here for a few minutes and, and get what this, what's going on here. Um, there's problems in the church. And Paul is going to bring up two meals, the communal meal, which we just read about, and then the Lord's Supper or the communion meal. And, and with the backdrop of this communal meal, Paul is saying there is a problem. And at the communal meal, you're not getting along with each other. In fact, you have serious issues in your heart toward each other. And then you partake of communion as if everything is good. This should not be so. So let's get some basics in the understanding of what communion is. And during communion, there's two elements that are passed out. There's the bread and the cup. Uh, the bread represents the body of Jesus that was hung on the cross and beaten. And, and the cup represents the blood of Jesus that was shed. Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And in and, and the cup that we use, we fill it with grape juice. Uh, some churches... Uh, use wine in their cups. In fact, I was uh, officiating a wedding. It was several years ago, and it was at another church of a particular denomination. And the pastor at that church agreed to allow me to be the pastor that officiated this wedding. And he only had one thing he wanted to deal with on me before I did the communion service. He said, in the communion service, when they have, or in the wedding service, when they have communion, they're going to use real wine. They're not using none of that grape juice. Do you understand? I'm saying, that's what you're having an issue over or whatever. So I, so I said, yeah, that's fine. You know, whatever you want to do. So I just thought it was interesting. I also thought this is interesting. When I was very young, I was about 10, and, and uh, when I was an altar boy in the Catholic Church, at, I had full access to the wine cabinet. Because you would fill up. How many of you were raised Catholic? You, so you know those big old chalices, I think they're called. It was like 10-year-old boys filling those things up with wine. And uh, that's when the trouble starts. <laughs> and praise God for salvation. <laughs> but <laughs> anyways, so there wasn't much reverence at that point. But when we look at the bread and you look at the cup, right, the two elements in the communion service, uh, we remember that Jesus took the cup of judgment, so when we partake of communion, we get the cup of forgiveness. It's a reminder of that. In fact, Isaiah chapter 51, verse 22, there uh, Isaiah writes, Thus says your God, the Lord, and your God, who pleads the cause of His people, See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling. I have taken out of your hand the dregs of the cup of my fury, you shall no longer drink it. Wow! That was a promise to the people of Israel. 
You will not have the cup of my fury anymore. You will not have the cup of my judgment. You will not have the cup of my trembling. And when you translate it into the New Testament, for all those who are in Christ Jesus, we understand that Jesus drank the cup of judgment. Jesus took on the cup of trembling, the cup of fury, so that by trusting in Christ, we wouldn't take on that cup of judgment. By believing in Him, we recognize He was judged, so I won't be judged. And when we partake of the communion elements, that is what we recognize. Man, I have forgiveness. Jesus was judged for my sins as if He committed my sins. Wow! So that I wouldn't be judged for my sins. In fact, Jesus said of Himself in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Who, who's lost? If you're a sinner, you are lost. And then if you're in Christ, you are found. Christ found you, by the way. I was lost, but now I'm found. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And this forgiveness is for anyone. It's for reprobates. It's for sinners of all sorts. It is for the prostitute. It is for the drunk. It is for the one who cheats on their taxes. It is for the gossip. It is for the thief. It is for anyone who will come to him and ask him for the forgiveness of their sins. And in fact, as we have been going through the One Life series, we've met all these different people that Jesus ministered to and he saved. Remember the man at Gadarenes? He had a legion of demons in him and Jesus cast the demons out of him. Remember that man? We have the man at Gadarenes. Mary Magdalene also had demons in her and was a, a sinful woman. And Christ reached her and forgave her. And then you have the story of the prodigal son reminding us that the Father will forgive anyone who will just turn to Him. And, and last Sunday, we saw where Matthew, also known as Levi, the tax collector that was hated by people, and, and he was greedy and took, an, took advantage of everybody he possibly could and jesus reached him and saved him and forgave him and said follow me i, I love this because jesus seeks and saves those who are lost so with this as the understanding that we're sinners and jesus saves sinners to address the subject of the problem of communion that the people in corinth were having Paul reminds us of what we just read. It's the communal meal in verses 17 through 22. What is the communal meal? Well, essentially, it's for a lack of other uh, terms, it's a, like a potluck is how we would think of it today. In fact, in the book of Jude, Jude verse 12, Jude called it a love feast. But at this love feast, there, the people weren't feeling the love. The problem was this. There were divisions. There were very evident prejudices within the body of Christ. The haves would not help out the have-nots. The haves wouldn't associate with the have-nots. So what would happen is this group of Christians would get together to celebrate this meal together and then they, after they celebrate the meal, they're going to partake of the communion service, the Lord's Supper, and they're all supposed to just act as if everything is okay. So if you are poor, this is what Paul is addressing. If you're a poor person, you hear all of the Christians are getting together next Sunday. And they're going to have a little Bible study and some worship. And then they're going to have a big meal. And then after they have the big meal, the big barbecue, um, after that takes place, then they're going to have this communion service. So if you're a poor person, you're thinking, that, great, this is the one time of the week. I get to get together with my brothers and sisters and it's going to be joyful. I, I don't have much money. My clothes are shabby. I come from the wrong side of the tracks. And, and, and I don't have any money in my bank account. But praise the Lord in Christ, uh, the rich people aren't going to care. We're just going to do a big group hug and everybody's going to get along. Then they would get to this love feast. And they would find out they're humiliated there. The people are looking at them like, look at your shabby clothes. You want to associate with us? The rich we're eating and, Paul says, getting drunk and just partying. Imagine that. And then partaking of communion. And the poor are just less hungry and miserable. Maybe next week it'll be better. They go back the next week in their shabby clothes because it's the best they got. And the next week they experience the same thing. And this is, this is 
humiliating. This is not fun. This is an embarrassment. Paul says, man, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Verse 18. When you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. The term divisions comes from this Greek word schisma. Get our English word schism. It means a cleft or tear. As in the tearing of a, a garment. When you come together, you're supposed to come together in the name of Christ. You're going to worship the Lord. You're going to celebrate. You're going to have a Bible study. You're going to eat. And then you're going to partake of communion. But when you guys get together, immediately there's a tearing apart of the church. There's prejudices that are taking place within the body of Christ. He says this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Now these things can... These divisions, these tearing of a garment, like uh, the tearing of the church, he's talking about the heart problem. And on the outside, obviously, you get the you get the clicks forming. You know. Um, when you you observe this, it, it can happen in so many different ways. Paul is addressing the issue of the rich and the poor. Prejudice is based on those lines. Uh, we can have prejudices often in the church based upon legalism. You know, legalism is, it's like, well, if you don't go to church the way I go to church, then you're probably not saved, right? Often with the way that you dress. Right? On, on Communion Sunday, I usually dress something like this. And if I break tradition and not dress like this on a Communion Sunday, look out! Somebody might think I've sinned in the past week. Oh no, what happened to it? Look, his clothes have changed. He's not wearing a tie today. People get weird. Have you ever noticed that? There's churches that teach if a woman isn't wearing a dress that goes all the way to her ankles all the time. Not just on Sunday, right? Uh, mm, probably not a holy lady. Right? I may not be saved, right? Uh, women can't may wear makeup. If you wear makeup, you're, there's something wrong with you. I like what J. Vernon McGee says. If the house needs painting, paint it, right? When he's talking about makeup. So... I didn't make that up. I did not make that up, folks. I did. J. Vernon McGee said that. Um, if you have long hair, if you're a man, uh, I don't know about that. So legalism. Uh, there's various uh, skin color. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, there's another way that we have our divisions, our schisms, our tearing apart of the church. Uh, political differences. NFL. Need I say more? Have you, have you guys know there's an NFL problem right now? Anybody hear of that? Here's the deal. Let me, let me, I can illustrate for this for you in 15 seconds. If I were to say such and such about Donald Trump, you would, half of you would think one thing about me, the other half would think another thing about me. If I said such and such about the NFL, half of you would think one thing about me, the other half would think something else about me we would immediately have a tearing of the church over an opinion that I have. So you want to know what my opinion is? I'm not going to give it to you. Because I know what will happen. I, I, I know what's going to happen. This is the problem Paul is addressing. You've got prejudices that come from all different angles. And we have opinions. But we should be able to work out those opinions between each other, but never let it take the precedence over the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, Jesus saves. Jesus saves Republicans. Maybe even in Congress. I don't know. People say Jesus saves Democrats. And all kinds of people in between and other persuasions and different colors of skin. And different people who are rich and people who are poor. And, and sometimes this is what happens within a church. And we can start to do a blame thing or a judgment thing and have our prejudices and forget, you know what, we are brothers in Christ. Because that person votes differently than me, because that person does or does not get into this NFL thing or whatever they are, doesn't mean they're going to heaven or hell. And, and Paul's like, what are you guys doing? You've got these divisions among you. And then he says this in verse 19. There must be factions 
among you. That those who are approved may be recognized among you. There must be factions. There must be divisions among you. Now the word factions in verse 19, it comes from a Greek word where we get our English word heresies. So what he's saying is the divisions come which break into these heresies that bring a spiritual division within the body of Christ because of opinions that are different or judgmental toward brothers and sisters. He says, man, this is messed up. But, he says, there must be these factions, these divisions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Now, he's not saying the Lord loves the divisions that come into the church. The whole subject is he doesn't. But they are there. In fact, the Bible tells us what the Lord thinks about divisions. In Proverbs chapter 6, seven things are an abomination to the Lord. A proud look, a lying tongue, um, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, that's four, uh, feet that are swift in running to evil, five, a false witness who speaks lies, six, and one who sows discord uh, or division among the brethren. Gossip would fall into that category. Um, complaining and going around into a group. and God can even save gossipers. But he says he hates this stuff. They are an abomination to him. The point is, in verse 19, there must be these divisions or factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized by you. This is how this works out. The word approved comes from a Greek word dokamos, and it means to test metals to see if they are genuine. Paul is saying God is sovereign, and he will use difficult people in the body of Christ to prove those who really love him. The way that metal is tested. You'll be tested. By difficult people. Ever felt tested by people? Okay. So think back. Go back about 2,000 years. There's different ways to test metals. One of them is to heat up, uh, heat it, like gold. So 2,000 years ago, you have the smelter who's got a big pot of gold, and there's fire underneath it. And as the pot gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the gold becomes more and more liquid, molten. And the hotter it gets, the more the impurities, the dross, float to the top. As the impurities float to the top, the smelter would clear off the impurities, the drag, the the stuff, whatever it's called, slag, drag. Don't mess me up. (laughs) Or are you correct? The dross. And it gets all of that off. And the smelter could tell when the gold was pure. When the smelter could look inside the pot of gold, and it was like a mirror. He could see his face. God uses difficult people, difficult situations to test us. And when we are, verse 19, approved, it's like he will see the image of his son in our lives. So God is saying, look, Paul saying, look, God is sovereign. He will even use those things to prove those who genuinely love him. Uh, I had a friend of mine who used to tell me, he, he mentored me when I was a brand new believer. Um, and he used to tell me when I would have a difficult situation with a difficult person, he would say, those are opportunities to shine. I hated it when he would say that because it was all the time. Rah, 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 rah. That's an opportunity to shine. Just, ah. But that's what, that's what Paul is saying. This is an opportunity for you to shine with the image of the sun working in your life. So you have this backdrop, the prejudices. And they can be for all these various reasons. In the case here, it's the rich versus the poor. The poor go away hungry. The rich are getting drunk. The poor are neglected. The poor are humiliated by the others when they should be welcomed into the body of Christ and fit into the mix. It's real easy to do that in a church the same way. Well, this person, you know, they aren't, you know, obviously they aren't, uh, they aren't supporting much. They shouldn't partake in this and they shouldn't partake of that. I praise the Lord for this church because when we have like a, a youth 
retreat or something like that, people step up to the plate and say, I want to sponsor a kid or I want to sponsor five. That's, that's the way it's supposed to operate. You know, and what a blessing it is. So we, but we have the communal meal. That is the backdrop of the way it's not supposed to be. Uh, we have the communal meal, but we also have the communion supper. That's the Lord's Supper. So they get together for this meal. Then they're going to partake of communion, the bread and the cup. And this is what Paul says. For I received from the Lord, verse 23, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which He was betrayed, He took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is My body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. In the same manner, He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of Me. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Wow! So, they're supposed to be getting along. Paul is letting them know, you guys got heart issues. And then you partake of communion. As if everything is good. And it is not. So he reminds them what communion is about. We remember. We have a time of reflecting. A time to remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross. That His body was given for us and His blood was shed for us. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. When you understand that it, this is all about you being a sinner, when you understand what communion really is, it really ought to cause you to get along a whole lot better. But, but Paul is reflecting back on the words of Jesus when he was at the Last Supper. So what we have, first of all, remember, right? We remember the bread, we remember the cup, we remember what Christ has done for us. So this takes us, first of all, to the past. Because in communion, the past and the future meet in the present. So he's reminding us and reminding the people in Corinth that Jesus, at the Last Supper, he initiated the first what we call communion service. Now, do you remember what the Last Supper was? It was a Passover meal, the last Passover that Jesus celebrated with His disciples on the same night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. Remember that? So it was the Passover meal. What was the Passover meal? Well, the Passover meal was a reminder to the Jews and to us now that in ancient history, in ancient Jewish history, in centuries before, when the Israelites were held captive in Egypt, Moses had gone before Pharaoh and said, if you don't let the Lord's people go, then this judgment's going to come upon you. And then this judgment. And he kept right on going through the judgments. And Moses would not let the Israelites leave the land of Egypt in, uh, across the Red Sea into the promised land. So finally, God says, one last judgment. And this is what the last judgment is. At nighttime, on the particular night, Death is going to come upon all of the firstborn out of all of the land of Egypt. It's going to affect all the Egyptians. It's going to affect all of the Israelites, all of the Jews, all over the land. The only ones that will not experience the death of their firstborn are those Jews who sacrifice a lamb and take the blood of the lamb and put it on their doorposts above and also on both sides of the doorposts. Those people who have the blood of the Lamb covering their house, death will pass over them, and they will be freed from Egypt, and they will cross the Red Sea. Hence, Jesus was saying at the Passover meal, I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The lamb that was sacrificed in the day of Moses and all of the lambs that have been sacrificed and their blood, blood that was shed for Passover, all of them pointed to me, my body and my blood. Anyone who trusts in me for the forgiveness of sin will be forgiven. Spiritual death will pass them over. Therefore, when you die, you will not be judged for your sin. Death has passed you over. You will go from earth to heaven. The real Ultimate promised land. That's a pretty good deal. But I want to point this out too. 
because it's just part of the communion service. When Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples, this is a picture of Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper where Jesus has got the bread and he's, he says, this is my body, and he's got the cup. He's saying, this is my blood. They were representing who he was, right? When you look at this, it wouldn't have exactly looked like this with Jesus there and the disciples on the side. It would have looked a lot more like this. They all would have been sitting around each other, leaning over and partaking of the Passover meal. It wouldn't have actually looked like this. This looks like Jesus did a photo op. He said, this is what I want you guys to do. All oh, you guys on my right, you guys on my left, let's take a big picture. It would have actually looked more like that. But nevertheless, at the Passover meal, the Last Supper, Jesus got ready to be betrayed. He's going to go to the cross in the morning. He's letting them know, I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. First Corinthians tells us, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. We partake of communion in remembrance of what Jesus has done. And by the way, in accordance with the Bible, the Bible tells us this, prophesying of Jesus, Psalm 34, verse 20, that not one of his bones would be broken. However, if you have a New King James Bible like I do, my Bible says here in verse 24, Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Well, wait a minute, that says not a bone of his would be broken. And we know a bone of his wasn't broken, but here Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. What is that all about? In a very real sense, the flesh of Jesus was broken. His flesh was torn open. It's interesting, by the whips and the beatings and the punishments. His flesh was torn open because of our sin, but here God teaches us that our issues, our divisions we have against each other are tearing each other apart and tearing into His holy name. He says, you come to communion. This is what, it's, it's a heart thing. You have prejudices, whatever they may be over. You have sin issues going on in your life. Um, because this shouldn't be this way. In fact, we are to remember, as First John says, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So, in communion, you have the past, and you also have the future. Verse 26 says, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. I love that. And that you know what that means, don't you? Until He comes again. It means Jesus is coming again. Look, I don't know how y'all feel about this, but I look at the news a lot. And it is not pleasant. In fact, they have this news program on now, on, on his channel, uh, Don Stewart's, Barry Stagner, Mike McIntosh have theirs. Now they added mine. And, and I look at this, and my dad watches it. He loves it. Because I relate it all to the second coming of Christ. My mom refuses to watch it. She says, it's too depressing. Everything you talk about is so awful. I said, all I do is just, it's just the news that's out there. But the news is so bad, it can be overwhelming. This is how, this is how I keep going forward. Remembering, man, things are bad, but one day it's going to be good. Jesus, you are coming I've been forgiven of my sin, the past, and I know where I'm going. I remember Jesus. I, I know He's coming again. That's what Paul was saying. I know that because of Christ, I am going to the place where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more tears, right? I've got no more funeral homes, no more hospitals, no more attorneys, no more taxes, no more debts. No more doctors. I'm sorry if you're a doctor, but you're just not going to be needed as a doctor up in heaven, man. This is, this is. But I look at the bad news, and I'm able to make sense. When I look at my Bible, and ah, oh, Jesus is coming again. So we have, in communion, we have the past and the future. They meet, lastly, in the present. Look at this, verse 27. And therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Uh-oh. 
Verse 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This doesn't sound good. For this reason, verse 30, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep, or many have died. That's radical. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Wow. This is heavy. What God is letting us know is, look, you partake of communion. Remember you're a sinner. Remember I am holy and you're not. And he's making it very clear. Some are sick. Some have even died because of the way they haven't partaken of communion. I have heard scholars, I've read scholars and pastors go over that and say, it can't mean what it says. And and over trying to make sense of it, listen, this is what it says. There are some people who are sick because they've partaken of communion in an unworthy manner. And it says some people have died. I don't, I, I mean, for me, that's a scary verse. Because I think to myself, well, the last time I put sick of communion, last month, uh-oh, what have I done since last month? I'm going to tell them, no, I'm going to die if I take it. So how's this work out? You don't partake in an unworthy manner. Now understand this also. This says, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus doesn't give us an out. As a Christian, he doesn't give us an out. He's, the whole thing is, some of you in Corinth are doing this wrong, and some of you are messed up because you're, you're, you're dishonoring the Lord. The Lord's dealing with you. You're willing to examine yourself, the Lord's dealing with you. Right? But he says, do this in remembrance of me. He doesn't even give us an option on communion. Isn't that interesting? And what he's letting us know is, you partake of communion. But when you partake of communion, you understand, I'm a sinner. You contemplate and say, God, search my heart. Like the psalmist in 139. Psalm 139. Search my heart and know my ways and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Right? We search our hearts. God, examine me. Partaking of communion is not about you being perfect and then you partake. And some Christians get stuck in that. I've got to be perfect, then I'll partake of communion. Partaking of communion is recognizing... I'm not perfect. Therefore, I need communion. That's why you partake of communion. I'm not perfect. I need forgiveness. I need help. I need hope. Listen, you might be a gossiper. You might be a person who's prejudiced for all different kinds of reasons. You could be a thief. You could be a liar. Um, There could be a habit that you've had. 20 years of being a Christian. 15 years of being a Christian. And you're saying, I can't get over the sinful habit, therefore I'm going to pass communion. No, let today be a new day. For any of these categories, let today be a new day. God, this is a problem I have. Cleanse me, forgive me, empower me, strengthen me to have victory in this area. You know what? The Lord may give you victory like that. And... It may be like it is with me in some areas where, look, I've been a Christian almost 30 years. Very close to 30 years now. And, but with that, I, I, I know this, that I've got heart problems. But I know that I'm not as bad as I was 30 years ago. So there's this process, God is leading me on. So when I go to the place of communion, God forgive me, strengthen me, give me victory here. And He is, he is making me better. He he is cleaning up the dross. He does purify me. And we recognize, God, I I need you. May today's time of communion be that time of celebration for you. A time of new beginning for you. This is what communion is about. God, I am a sinner. I, I shouldn't pass up the elements. I need the elements. God, forgive me. Make this a new day, a new beginning for me, even if you're already a Christian. I need victory in this area of my life. God, thank you for...